again and welcome to another episode of BitNote. This is David Collins. We've got some great video game music lined up. Have a listen and hope you enjoy. Hello again and welcome to another episode of BitNote. So, as usual, I was just looking around trying to get some great video game music for you and I came across this classic game I played a long time ago. It was hard, it was difficult, but it was pretty good and it portended things that were to come. Especially since the developer of this game ended up having a greater role in this sort of stuff. So, I'm going to play you some music from Rick Dangerous. Have a listen and hope you enjoy. And that was that little bit of cute music there was from Rick Dangerous. Rick Dangerous was actually developed was it was kind of an Indiana Jones kind of spoof, heavily inspired slash sort of video game. For instance, very early on in the game, you're going through the stone ruin called the Lost Temple, and then a gigantic rock boulder pops up behind you, and you desperately have to run across and keep ahead of it. It was developed by Core Design, who continued with the idea of uh, making Indiana Jones-inspired stuff later, but then decided for a later game to actually make the uh, character female. They ended up creating Laura Croft uh, in the game Tomb Raider, and the rest is history, being a hugely successful game series that's recently been kind of rebooted, and it's just, and basically one of the major icons of video gaming. So it just goes to show, sometimes when you rip off Indiana Jones, you get a really nice little fun 2D platformer, and sometimes you get a new icon of the gaming industry. It all depends. The music you just heard there was from the title screen and also from the intro to The Lost Temple. I don't know who composed it because the credits don't seem to say and I have a bit of a tricky time figuring it out. The game itself is also noted for, despite being a fun fun a bit unforgiving it's one of those games typified a lot of games back then where you could easily die just by doing something completely reasonable and so you'd actually have to remember it for the next time and just remember the traps in advance some people find it bad game design others find it a reason to just really master it but regardless it's a trend that's that's gone down a fair bit these days and so more games are a bit more challenging so on to uh, the next game and i am going to hit you with a great game that um I actually took me quite a bit of time to get my hands on, and I'll talk about it more. Before I do, I think I'll just introduce you with the uh, starting song of this. It is called um, Going to Lunati, and uh, I'll just play it, and I'll talk a bit more about the game afterwards. So, have a listen, and hope you enjoy.
Hope you all enjoyed that one. What you just heard there was Going for, to Lunatia. It was by Kanako Kankino and is from the game Klonoa 2 Lunatia's Veil, which was developed by Namco. So, Klonoa. I talked about this game before. Um, essentially, I'd heard about Klonoa before as a game character and everything. And then I was searching the PlayStation Store online and then I noticed they had the original Klonoa Door to Fantimile uh, available. So I downloaded it, I played it, and I had so, so, so much fun. I never had a PlayStation 1 back then, which kind of put me a bit out of the gaming mainstream at the time. But I played this game, and I just really, really, really did enjoy it. And I did some research, and I find that the game had a lot of spin-offs. It was never quite as successful, the term is franchise, but it did have one fully and official sequel to it, which was released for the PlayStation 2. Now, the tricky part is that um, I actually had remembered walking into a game shop years and years ago, back when I was still like a real Dreamcast into Dreamcast, and I saw this game called Klonoa 2, and it was for sale for the PlayStation 2, and there was a big display for it. And I looked at it and thought, Haha, that character looks so much like Sonic the Hedgehog. But... Um, well, the, it had the whole, like, unified eyes and expressions, and even the art style looked a bit like Sonic. So, I mean, I was kind of curious. I kind of gave it a pass. But then years later, of course, after playing the first Klonoa game, I was saying, damn it, how do I get my hands on this really cool, you know, Klonoa game? And the answer was Rage. Not just my Rage, Rage the shop, the game retro shop in Fade Street, Dublin. And yes, I am totally promoting them because when a shop manages to get my hands on a really cool game, I am very, very happy. To make a quick diversion here, Rage is basically a specialty retro video game shop. It's not like... There's a bunch of places called Sex... C-E-X. Oh, damn it, that's probably why they spelt it C-E-X, because when people try to pronounce it, it comes across that way. But yes, um, the exchange. Uh, there's a lot of those sort of shops around Dublin at the moment where basically you can buy and sell retro video games. So what's how's the rage any different? Well, the rage isn't... It's like a specialty. It really... It cares about records, but it really cares about retro games. And they really do their research to make sure they're stocked up with like some really unique and retro games. The thing is... They know which ones are valuable. They know which games are actually, you know, hard to get by and they price accordingly. So you can go in there and you could see like that, uh, that I think it was Time Stalker's game for the Dreamcast and it's like way like 70 euro or something and then I've got, got Majora's Mask and all this sort of like cool, like very obscure stuff for sale. I one time told them about how I saw like a, a game of Panzer Dragoon Saga for the Saturn like on sale online for a really slow price and they were kind of just shocked about it. But that's kind of what they do. Some of the games are kind of expensive, but there's plenty of like really, really cheap ones. Like I got Enter the Matrix there, which is cheap for a damn good reason, not in the least because the version I got didn't actually have the box with it. But it was always kind of a game that I wanted to play because it just kind of like hooked into the sort of pop culture at the time. I am going on a huge tangent here. The point is, Rage, I asked Rage, you know, any chance of getting Klonoa 2, and they basically took down my name and phone number, and they said when they got it in stock, they would. And later on, yes, what have you? I managed to get, they, they phoned me up, they said they had Klonoa. I raced in, managed to buy the game, brought it home, and played it on the PlayStation 2. And that was fun. Now, one thing has I, you can pick up from all the tracks I'm playing here, it has a pretty great soundtrack as well. So um, I'm going to just quickly switch over to what I think is one of the more fun uh, soundtracks of it. It's when you're going surfing along a great big snowscape and having lots and lots of fun and jumping over obstacles and trying to grab some stuff. Uh, the track is called Stepping Wind. Uh, so have a listen and hope you enjoy.
meant that, my friends, was Stepping Wind. It was, of course, from the video game Klonoa 2 by Namco, and it had vocals by Kumiyuku Wanabe, and it was made by Kanako P. Kakino. And uh, Kamiko Wantanabe has actually done a lot of them, um, has done some voice act. She plays the voice of actually Klonoa, who's the titular character of this game, as well as doing some anime like Sergeant Frog and Inuyusha. So, um, basically, what's the deal with Klonoa? Well, essentially, he's what's called a dream traveler. And this is actually one of the things that I'm always trying to work out about the things. The idea is that he falls asleep. I think he dreams and travels between dreams. And I'm not sure whether these dreams are meant to be like alternate universes or his own just dreams, whether he's just making everything up inside his mind or whether there's just something more to it. It's it's kind of one of those things I always wanted to figure out a little bit more about the series. But um, regardless of that... Uh, essentially, he finds himself in a, someone is calling out for help, and uh, he ends up in this universe. And then he meets up with a, a priestess and the priestess's assistant, and they discover that the world is in danger. It's got to do with all these bells that are ringing, and apparently someone's making a bell that's not meant to be wrong or will cause chaos if it does. So basically, their job is to go to a couple of arbitrary re- re- locations for what are in common parliaments known as MacGuffins in order to actually make sure that the world doesn't go kablooey or some variant thereof. Kind of, so far, so standard. But it's got a lot of cuteness to it. There's some nice cutscenes and some nice stories. And uh, then, of course, and it's all bright and colourful, got some good music. And, of course, there's the gameplay. Now, the gameplay is very much like the first game, only this time it's more 3D, but it's still, the gameplay is still perfectly 2D. It's it's something called 2.5D, which a bunch of games such as, like, Pandemonium and um, more recently the cave uh, employed, whereby it's still basically a 2D platformer in that you move left and right and jump up and down and try to org to yourself, but everything is rendered in complete 3D. And so you can actually, so you can see a background, the camera pans up and down, you still jump. And in addition to this, it's also got this, the Klonoa games always tend to be rather inventive by how they uh, do the um, 3D. They have the they have the 2D plane twist and turn through the 3D world and you can shoot into the background and foreground. And you have, in one case, there's basically two like planes, one in the foreground, one in the background. And you can jump between the foreground and the background and then have to pick up these bombs and throw them. And speaking of pick up bombs and throwing them, that's another dynamic Klonoa has. He's able to pick up enemies and throw enemies. So the idea is that enemies are not just your opponent, but they're also your ammunition to defeat other opponents. And uh, then you can even use them for what are called double jumps by jumping up in the air and jumping off them. So it's it's it was always a very nice uh, gameplay system that just, just seemed to work very well because it was very responsive, but it was very, very flexible. And with Klonoa 2, they've tried to expand the whole thing by making it possible to do it in a lot more locations. You see, one of the things about Klonoa is that while it's very, very bright and colourful and everything, there's sometimes, like I said, I'm sometimes... I think I'll just play you with another song that'll help me. That'll help explain it a bit more. Um, it's a little like if you've ever read the Neverending Story or any other sort of like dream-related stuff, where it's meant to be kind of surreal and fun, but you can't help but wonder if it actually is a metaphor. There's a, there's a hidden meaning behind what's going on. While some of the game's levels should be taken at face value, such as going through the sea and stuff, there's one part of the game that's called um, that's the Moonlight Museum, also called the Maze of Memories, where It just gets very surreal. I'm going to play a track from this and talk a bit more afterwards. Have a listen.
And what you just heard there was Moonlight Museum version 1. It is from the Maze of Memories level of Klonoa 2. It was composed by Hiromi Shibano and, of course, from Klonoa 2 by Namco. And by the way, as I said, the tracks before that were Kanoka P. Kikino, who is also the music director of Klonoa 2, so... And she's definitely very good at that. Okay, so uh, Moonlight Museum is kind of weird. You're basically in this place and it's very surreal and gravity keeps reversing and everything's got kind of a checkerboard pattern. And people are talking about um, how essentially, um, you know, they're looking at past memories and this is what they're doing about. Why look at the future when they can look back at memories? So there seems to be very something symbolic about that. And indeed, there's something symbolic about the whole air world you're in. The idea is it's divided into um, four kingdoms and each kingdom has got an interesting theme. One of them is all about joy and carnivals and happiness. The other is always about conflict where the inhabitants are pulled into an eternal war. And um, one of them is just about tranquility, which is good. And um, yeah, especially towards the end, I mean, comparisons between Klo and a few other characters does seem to get kind of weird. But in the meantime, you're just having fun. You're jumping around. There's You've got some great, you know, scripted pieces and sequences going on. A really big, vibrant world and a lot of cool levels to go through. So uh, this is all sort of hamstrung by the fact that if you ever want to play it, it's kind of hard to get your hands on. Look what I had to go through. I had to go to a specialty video game shop just in order to play it. But Klonoa 2 is a good game. It's kind of unfortunate that the series never quite got a lot of popularity. Why it didn't get more popular, there's actually a lot of questions. They were considering redesigning the character for this game, but fan backlash made them not. The series does have its fans. And, um, I mean, one person just claimed that the reason why it wasn't successful is because by around that time, everyone were getting into full 3D games like Spiro the Dragon or, you know... Crash Bandicoot or whatever. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I mean, I still think Klonoa 2 is a pretty good game, vibrant with a good story, and I very much like it. I'm going to leave you now by uh, the last song. It's called Traveler by Asuki Saka. I think she made a really great track with this. It's nice. It's It really helps finish off the game. And it's kind of poignant as well. I mean, the game does have its poignant moments and not quite as many or intense as the previous one, but I still very much like it. So, uh, this is David Collins with BitNote. Have a listen, hope you enjoy, and thank you very much for listening.